you described it as the water conveys down gradient. That's correct. Fantastic. Thank you. That's all I had, man. No one's here. If you're waiting okay. on me. Any other questions? There being none. Thank you. I'm going to have to thank me, the traffic consultant. Thank you. So these presentations get shorter. <laughs> this is pretty, de this is pretty deadly. <laughs> Sorry? This is pretty deadly. <laughs> I'll just, as a prelude uh, to Mr. Smead's um, review, he's just going to review for you the um, updated traffic analysis and compare that data for you to what was projected to flow from Four Seasons and other projects on Ken Island in 2004 when, um, uh, when the APF was approved. And he's going to show you that there's a projection from 2004 the development in the pipeline and growth and the four seasons are significantly conservative compared to what's played out today. That's really the whole purpose. Could you introduce yourself? My name is uh, Ken Schmid. I'm with the tra uh, company Traffic Concepts. We've been involved in the four season project since I think 1998 and, and involved in all the traffic impact studies to date for that uh, project and, and negotiations with the county and the state and to get it approved and uh, uh, from a traffic standpoint. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the APFO traffic impact study requirements. Yeah, they're pretty familiar. You want me to go into that a little bit, Joe? go into that? No, go ahead. You just promised that your presentation gets shorter as you guys <laughs> come in here. <laughs> I think it focus on, on, okay. on what you're yeah. with Okay, you. well, basically, we did the, the, the formal traffic impact study as part of the original preliminary plan approval. And the latest the study that established APF approvals was in 2004. And it assumed 1,350 units. Um, and we prepared the traffic impact study in accordance with the county guidelines. County guidelines set up what methodology I use to, uh, to calculate capacity, what uh, information I, I use is background development. I don't, background development is, is, consists of projects in the area that are active but not yet built. And it also includes something called regional growth. And regional growth is in the county law that says you're required to add two years of 2% growth for every year up to the build out of the site. So the original 2004 study projected a 12 year build out for this site. So we added basically 25% increase in traffic flow. Now there's always been some discussion about regional traffic on Route 18 and Route 8. And it really doesn't make much sense that there's regional traffic, regional traffic increases are along 50 corridor. Uh, so regional traffic is basically that traffic that is generated outside of the uh, study area, but, it, but travels through. So a development in uh, Annapolis and a housing development in Queenstown, that's regional traffic because it's those people are going to work up across the bridge and that's regional growth. Regional, that doesn't happen on 18 in Route 8, Route 8's a dead end road. <laughs> so there's no regional traffic in and out of the island. And for the most part, hmm? Speak up so they can hear you. and for the most part, it, it doesn't occur much on 18 or 8. So um, what we found with our updated studies, we've done updated studies for phase one, phase two, and phase three, just to test that the improvements that we proposed will, will, are still mitigating the impact of development since it was so long ago. And that was the request for the county. So we did those studies uh, and we consistently showed that the projected volumes in the 2004 study were never met. And the levels of service now are much better than they were projected in 2004. 
I believe that has all to do with regional growth. It just didn't occur, and that was the most significant thing we added. Background developments along the corridor, unless it's a huge development right next to your site, it's not going to have a great impact. If you have a, say, a Safeway store that built over on the other side of the bridge over there, it'll have a somewhat of an impact on Cass Marine Road and some of those in the Route 8 corridor, but not as much. It doesn't really have that big impact. And so I surmise that the extra traffic we assumed in 2004 has to go back to the regional growth. Um, for the studies we've done, we updated counts. Um, the last counts we did here were 2019, before COVID. So we had counts in the uh, fall of 2019 as part of COVID. And um, so we had some pretty accurate counts to do the study on. Um, and the result was when we went through the project that the, the intersections all are operating at much better levels of service than the future was predicted. And that is consistent with phase one, phase two, and the phase three and four study. <laughs> this is just an example. We, we made a couple charts to give you an example of what um, we're talking about. So the first chart here is, is, a, weekday, is a weekday time period. It, the, the first two columns is the AM peak hour. The second two columns is the PM peak hour. And what we try to do is to show you what we predicted in background levels of service in 2004. So that would be the existing counts, the background developments, and the regional growth added. And we looked, compared that to the existing critical lane volume at these intersections. And you can see that the critical lane volumes under 220 are existing are much lower, which is better, than they were predicted in the 2004 study. And that, again, has to do with the, the fruition of the background developments, the 24% 20, added as part of the regional growth. And AM is a little more volatile than PM. Traffic flows through intersections vary from 3 to 5% on a daily basis, depending on when people leave early or late. So there is some fluctuation. But this is just to give you the overall big look at what the difference is. PM, you can see that the... PM volumes are a little more uh, static, and they're pretty more, more uh, they don't vary as much, and you can see, but still, the 2004 background, which didn't include any of Four Seasons impact, you would have thought that would have been all built out by now, and we show our existing volumes, and we're a good level service or better in terms of critical lane. Um, another way we looked at it is we looked at the full build out, in the 2000 four seasons full hmm? build out yeah the the build out of four the full build out of four seasons so we predicted the impact the other background didn't have any impact from four seasons so this is the 2004 full build out predicted and this is the 2020 phase 3 4 which includes phase 1 and 2 this is the whole impact of four seasons and you can see the critical lane volume uh, that was calculated for the two, in the 2020 study in the, in the fall in the 2004 study. And again, you can see uh, a lot of these intersections just didn't have that regional growth. When you talk about 25 percent to 100,000 cars, that's 250 trips. That's almost two levels of service from a critical lane standpoint. Um, some of these I'm intersections. Just, I'm just a little confused over this. The 2004 full build out. Why are the numbers different in the, the two? Between 2004 and 2020? No, 2004 and 2004. One, you have two columns that are One's AM and one's one PM. PM. Okay. Okay. The so okay. first column is AM and the second column is PM. Okay. That's why okay. they're different. Yeah, the, the columns are labeled a little differently than from that previous slide. Uh, so, Ken, and the, 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 with the full build out now, which is less than what was projected in 2004, you know, by some 280 some odd units. Um, all the intersections operate at levels of service still acceptable even under today's APF? Yes, and, and this study was reviewed and reviewed and reviewed a thousand times before 2004. We had private consultants reviewing this from that people hired. We had the state, the county, we had a commissioners hired a, a independent consultant to review the traffic impact study. 
And frankly, that came back with a glowing report that it, our study was very conservative and overestimated trips. Was and now this doesn't account for what happens um, during summertime. During no, summer I days. mean obviously we have issues, regional issues during the summer times. We we've looked at Saturday off peak, meaning not in the summer. And it's, they work better than the PM peak, so everything's still at an A or B or C level of service. During the summer, they asked, uh, the county asked us to actually count the summer traffic on a, on a July weekend. And we did. And we showed all A levels of service. But really? that's because nobody could flow through the intersection. <laughs> exactly. It was gridlocked. That was the irony of the whole traffic study. It showed everything was fine. Because but people weren't moving fast. Because no I was going to say, when you're sitting up, there, you know right? there's a traffic problem. Oh, <laughs> it doesn't hit the counter. No, right. they don't. They're gridlocks. So they, and I, we sort of knew that was a, going to be the result of this. And we plainly stated in our report that these are not accurate levels of service calculations. And we know that there are failures right. along this corridor when the Route 50. But that that's a super regional problem. And... Frankly, I think the state has to have a little more responsibility in what they've done because they promote the beach traffic. They promote, uh, and they've done some things. They've tried to spread out the impacts of people coming and going and trying to leave later. There's always talk about this third bridge. I don't know if that's ever going to take off, but I think there's still some things that the county, the state and the, and the county can do. I know they've tried to shut off some of the access roads, but the state's against that legally. I don't buy that because they set up detours all the time for construction. So I'm not sure I believe that can be, but that's the state's opinion. I think other things can be done too, looking at spreading out that Ocean City impact. Yeah, why can't, why can't we have a Wednesday to Wednesday? That's a whole different that's ball different of wax. Okay. So we don't, we're not saying that Four Seasons, they're, they're, these people are going to act like the rest of the Four uh, Ken Island residents and learn to sort of stay local on, uh, on, on Saturday and Sunday big time right. traffic. But the result is that we've overestimated all our improvements are in place. They far more than mitigated our impact, our actual impact. So it sort of shows that our 2004 study was that. Any questions? Then, Mike, okay. just Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. We are going to take a five minute recess. Thank you.
to work. All right, Ted, you good? Yes. Ready to go? We are back in session. Great. My name is Mike Irons. I'm the uh, division president for the uh, for K of Nanian Homes. Um, I'm also a Queen Anne's County resident. Um, appreciate your time to present today. Appreciate your service to the county. I'm um, going to give you a brief update on the community, what's going on at the community right now. Um, as you know, Barry and, and uh, Mr. Kuhn mentioned, phase one, you can see this aerial picture of phase one looking back is, is largely built out. We're selling a few more homes in there, but we're largely finished in phase one and we're actively developing in phase two. Um, despite you know the pandemic, the housing market has been very strong for us, which is great. You can see we have 164 of the homes sold to date. We've delivered 108 to happy uh, homeowners and we have 35 homes under construction. Um, we're selling at a pretty brisk, brisk rate, like over 10 a month, 10 homes we're selling per month. And with that uh, you know, volume, we've been able to add some you know, new employees and new teammates for our, for our construction team. We recently brought on two new construction managers, both of them Queen Anne's County residents, which we're happy to uh, support the county and provide jobs here. So right now of our sales and construction and management teams, over half of them are Queen Anne's County residents, I'm happy to say. So um, just as a projection, you know, we're the, uh, our projection for this year is to deliver over 100 homes here per year, and it will continue to grow as we go through the community. Here you can see our model home court. You know, we have four decorated models. They've been in place since 2018. Um, they're staffed seven days a week. We have three full-time sales uh, associates manning those uh, models uh, on a daily basis. Um, I'm gonna show you some of the pictures of our homes. Oh, first of all, I'm gonna show you, you know, here's an overview of uh, the entry of our community, one of our stormwater features. Um, this is taken from Castle Marina Road, looking back into phase one. You can see our homes there. Another one of the entrance monument going into phase one. So here's a picture of, uh, these homes, these are the homes that we're building in phase one. These will be consistent through phase two and three. Um, all of our homes are designed with the active adult age restricted buyer in mind. They're single story living with uh, owners bedrooms on the first floor and very few steps. Um, they range in size from 1400 square feet up to 3500 square feet. Here's a couple pictures of a few of them. Um, this is the Clarny. It's one of our best sellers. It's right around 2,000 square feet, two bedrooms, the home office, very popular size for, for this, uh, for our buyer here. I'd like to say also that, um, you know, our sales in phase two have gone very well. Um, and the, just the average sales price of our single family homes in phase two, our last 30 sales is $625,000. So we're bringing a you know, very quality home to the county and a great tax uh, benefit for the county as well. Um, moving on, here's a picture of uh, one of our completed condominium buildings in phase one. As mentioned previously, it's a 14 unit building. It has garages. Each unit has its own garage served by a central elevator. The units are uh, um, very luxurious from 2,000 square feet up to 2,600 square feet. Um, and they average uh, in sales price around 450 to 500,000. Our homes have won many awards from the Maryland Home Builders Association. Here's a picture of a couple of our awards. You know, Four Seasons um, is our brand name. It's a national brand name for us and it's, a, it's, a, it's about active lifestyle. And uh, right now our community, we have a full-time lifestyle director on staff at, their, our, at our community every day. She plans events, clubs, um, and different ev um, you know, things going on for our residents to participate in. There's Mahjong Club, Walking Club, there's a whole bunch of clubs, card games. They do a whole bunch of activities, you know, <laughs> holiday parties. What are you doing parties. with the clubhouse? Well, they do it, uh, they, some of those events we have in our, uh, in our model homes. Okay. We have a small gym in our model, and then a lot of it's outside. They play pickleball at the local parks, play tennis, you know, so they utilize the local facilities. But great segue into, you know, here's a picture of our clubhouse that we have under construction. 
Um, it's a 24,000 square foot clubhouse. It has an indoor pool, big outdoor pool, you know, pier. Um, it's a great facility, um, a premier facility for, for this area. Obviously on the water, we'll have am outdoor amphitheater, you know, sports courts, tennis courts, pickleball courts, things like that, um, fire pits. So this is, you know, um, a great facility. It's under construction. It was approved part of phase two. We, have, we plan to have it done in May of 2022. It'll take us about almost a year and a half to build it. Um, we're just coming out of the ground of, with it right now. You know, many of our residents, if you remember the phase two hearing that we had here last uh, a year or so ago, um, the room was filled with our supporters and homeowners. Unfortunately, they couldn't attend today because of the pandemic, but um, I think hopefully they'll be able to connect and, and provide some comment um, uh, virtually here today. And, uh, you know, it's important to them and it's important to us that this community, you know, that we achieve this final approval so that they can see this community be completed and along with their amenity that's under construction. So hopefully they'll be able to chime in um, and provide some comment. Here's an aerial view of, of phase three and four. This is what, you know, this is an artist rendering, um, kind of showing what, you know, how the, uh, you know, co condominium units will be arranged and the single families and all the open space that Tim and Barry spoke about. And you can see some of the stormwater features. You can see the amenity in the background. This is looking from the north, looking back <coughs> towards the south. Um, as mentioned, you know, the DRRA, our DRA is a, you know, a big important document for us. And, um, you know, we've completed many of the obligations in the DRRA. Here's a picture of the roundabout at 18 and Castle Marina Road. That's been complete. And you can see the cost of that was 1.1 million. Here's a roundabout at Castle Marina and our entrance. That cost us about 800,000 is com also complete. There's a, a, a hiker biker trail that we built along Castle Marina that goes uh, and connects ultimately to the Cross Island Trail. It's heavily used by the existing residents of Bayside, Queen Landing, as well as our residents to, to go up and connect to the uh, Cross Island Trail. That, that work is also complete. Um, some turn lanes on and off of Piney Creek Road. Uh, those turn lanes are complete. You can see them in the picture. The water tower has become a landmark for us. Um, that uh, was complete early on in the community and serves um, you know, the whole Ken Island uh, water system, not just four seasons. A large pump station we built serves our community as well as many of the other communities um, on Ken Island and, and in the Castle Marina <coughs> Road area. That facility is complete, costs us 1.6 million. We built a sewer line basically three miles across the entire Ken Island um, from our community. It picks up Cloverfields, Bayside, Queens Landing. Um, that costs us 2.6 million. Here's the, uh, an aerial picture of the parkland dedication that uh, Mr. Kuhn spoke about, the 130 acres um, that were dedicated to the county. We also forfeited 20% of our approved 271 units were forfeited when we, when we dedicated this to the county. It's, it's conveniently located on the Cross Island Trail. It's a waterfront property. It's bound on two sides by Cox Creek. It's a great property, but it's been deeded to the county for a uh, eco park. We're also um, under construction for a uh, Cross Island Trailhead Park. This is a parking lot and access for the Cross Island Trail. You can see in this aerial picture, the parking lot is already complete. It's located right along, this is on Piney Creek Road. You can see the Cross Island Trail right there. This is, a, this is gonna be a facility for county, public facility that we're gonna dedicate to the county, six and a half acres. Includes a parking lot and a restroom facility, which we're gonna build this year for residents to park and get on the trail with their bikes or walk. So it'll be a nice park. It also have a trail down to uh, Maycomb Creek where the, uh, and that's all um, land that we're gonna dedicate to the county when it's complete. 
um, contributions to the Kent Island Fire Department. Um, so far, we've dedicated uh, uh, four hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars to the to the vi uh, volunteer fire department. And in addition to that, our residents each pay ten dollars per month as part of their association dues. That goes on in perpetuity. Um, once that build out, it's one hundred twenty-nine thousand dollars a year that the uh, fire department will get from our residents. Here's a check. You know, the uh, picture. Us uh, giving the check to Jody Schultz, um, the president of the fire department, the last hundred thousand that we, we just dedicated to them at the end of 2020. The, the fire truck in the rear, Jody explained to me, is a rescue truck that all of our contributions helped them purchase. In addition to those improvements, there's several um, above and beyond payments that our company has made to the county. First was a million dollar payment. At phase one approval, that's been done. At our 400th building permit, we'll give another 350,000 for some road improvements at 18 and 552. And in addition, we pay um, 7750 uh, per home with impact fees. So you can see what that is per, you know, we paid over $2 million to date and we're getting new building permits every day. Um, and it gets up to 10.8 million. Lastly, probably our largest next big um, uh, DRA commitment that we've completed the design of is a, a water treatment plant that will be built behind the uh, Ken Island Elementary School near the library. It's on county property. We've been working with the sanitary district staff going through the re a review and design of that building and facility. You can see the cost of it is very significant at 8.6 million, includes a big industrial well. Um, this is a much needed facility and will serve, like the water tower, will serve a greater Kent Island water service area. And like Mr. Kuhn mentioned, this will be built um, as part of phase two, three, and four. So when you add all those up, it's over $32 million worth of DRRA commitments. This is, a, this is things that are above and beyond. This does not include anything on site. This is all off-site work that would normally be, not normally be with the development of, uh, of this. It doesn't include our on-site streets, any of that, none of our on-site stormwater management. This is all benefit that benefits the county as a whole. And where we, this is the most important thing, is where we are, we've, we've completed a, almost $15 million of those DRA commitments. So we're at 45% of that total value and we're only 10%, 10% occupied. Just over 100 homes have been occupied. So, the, you know, Havnanian, we have we've put out a significant amount of uh, capital to uh, continue and uh, and to build this project. And it's important that we receive this final approval so we can finish completing the community as well as also these remaining DRRA commitments. And lastly, the last thing I want to mention, you know, go back to the stormwater um, uh, items that Tim Glass spoke about us about oversizing. If you remember, he talked about that we significantly oversized, almost two, uh, almost 300 percent oversized our stormwater and sediment basins to have extra volume and capacity during some of these big rain events that we've had. In addition to that, we have implemented this rain for rent system and all of our stormwater ponds. And what it does is we capture as much water, you know, all the water we can in our stormwater ponds, and then we run it through a filter system. We literally filter the stormwater in our stormwater ponds. So we pump it out of the ponds. It goes through these blue tanks. There's a flocculant that's added to help remove sediment, and we discharge that water in our outfalls and it comes out very, very clear. The purpose of it is the filtration is to remove the suspended sediments, and it comes out and we discharge it as clear as it's coming out of the sky. So you can see in the number on there, we've, we, we have, it's, it's monitored um, and measured. It's very scientific, it's part of all of our approved plans. Um, we've filtered 198 million gallons of water since we started the, the uh, Four Seasons community 
at a cost of $3.7 million. So this is an extra level of protection to ensure, you know, uh, the protection of the environment and the, uh, you know, the Maycomb Creek and the Chester River and Cox Creek. Uh, I don't have anything any further. Um, once again, I appreciate your time and allowing us to present to you today. Okay, any questions for Mike? Oh, sure, Mr. Irons, thank you for that presentation. Uh, with respect to the pier uh, that's on Chester River, obviously that's not, um, you know, for boat slips for necessarily for your for your clientele. It's, it's one pier for a, you know, a thousand uh, home, home. Uh, so you, is that just sort of a public, uh, you know, a, a community amenity for access? I mean, it's, that's big water. Um, yeah. You and I both know what that can do to boats. So yeah, that's it, sort of how you envision that aspect? It, it's, um, yeah, it, it um, it's a transient. It has 10 transient slips. So it's not intended for overnight docking. It's, it's 450 feet long approximately. It's part of our title wetland license approval. Um, it's for transient docking. You know, it's for our residents to walk out, fish on, crab on. You know, they can pull in with their boat, maybe pick up some friends, drop off, tie up for a few minutes, jump in the pool up at the clubhouse, and then go back on their boat. But it's not intended for overnight docking. They will not be leased sl slips at all. We're encouraging many of our residents, and I think many of them already do, are using the commercial marinas in the Kent Narrows area sure. well, with, the with their boats. The community adjacent to you has those long breakwaters. I mean, that's it's obviously not a pleasant place to be on, a, on any kind of windy yeah, aspect absolutely. with the fetch. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So just curious as to sort of what the what the, the end goal for the community was to have that, and, and uh, certainly access to the resources is an important uh, aspect of of the lifestyle that your community uh, purports. So I just yep. just curious as to sort of how how that looked in the future. Any other questions? Any questions from up there? My, my question, you know, Sharon, is is what is different from what was approved? You know, okay, wait a minute. Who's who, okay? You have to this identify yourself. Okay, this is our Keepersburg. Uh, the, the question I would pose is, what is really different from the, pre, the prior approved uh, program um, that, you know, the county you know, says, go ahead, go forward, put in all the uh, things that you've discussed and identified. Is there anything significantly different than what, uh, you know, you were given the go ahead to put in place? No. No. No, Commissioner. Everything is... Aside from, you know, um, uh, slight locate, slight engineering differences throughout the site, everything is exactly the same as approved, except for the density is 271 units less because the Tanner piece was was is no longer part of it. But that layout is what was laid out and approved through growth allocation in 2001 as part of the DRRA in 2002 and then as part of the preliminary subdivision site plan approval in 2004. So everything has been laid out almost precisely as to what was proposed and there's no additional units and there's no change in the breakdown between multifamily condos and single families. They stay exactly the same. Well, they've decreased well, because decreased, you gave, yes. gave property and then You've increased your your um, amenities, so yes, that 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 has. But I mean, the the the, the there's no it, what was shown on phase phases one, two, three, and four to be I think X number of condos and X number of single families in 2004 is the same thing today. That, I mean, that's what my question was: is is anything that you know materially changed what you proceeded forward with? Uh, as having an understanding that if you did this, then you would get your approvals as you were going forward. That's correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll go back to your filtration system. What do you actually filter out, and what do you do with what you filter out? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so what we're filtering out is, um, you know, during construction, you know, there's a lot of exposed ground. So when, you know, we get a rain event, that rain, you know, um, conveys some of the sediment 
in the water it goes into our sediment basin so what we're filtering out is the suspended sediments like there's a lot of clay soils on ken island it's very fine it doesn't settle out readily and takes a lot of time to settle out so we're trying to accelerate that process to get the water clean and get that sediment out of the water so you're basically just collecting sediment you know that's correct yeah. sediment yeah. and then your your answer uh, the answer to your question is what um so when once that filtration process is complete, all those uh, sediments are in the bottom of those big blue tanks. There's baffles in that tank and allows the flocculent to help Settles. accelerate yeah. that coagulation and settlement of that sediment. And it, it's vacuumed out. It's vacuumed out and, and taken to the dump where sometimes we, we do put it on site in, in uh, common areas and things like that. It's just sediment. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. Thank you very much. All right, uh, open for discussion. Public comment. Public comment. We do have uh, two people here for public comment. Okay. Uh, first is Mr. Roy Smoot. Good morning. Good morning. Please come up, introduce sure. yourself and. Yes. Yeah, so we can hear you with the microphone. Excellent. Thank you. Most people don't have a problem with my voice. <laughs> um, again, I thank you um, for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, I was here at the last uh, public hearing. Um, I, for Havanian. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Planning is on yes. And uh, my wife and I occupied the fifth home built in the neighborhood. So we have 22 months or more, about 22 months experience living in the neighborhood. Um, I would say that our experience in working with Four Seasons in the community has been nothing but stellar. They under-promise, over-deliver. Um, if I have a problem, I feel perfectly comfortable going to Mike, um, know that it's going to fix, be fixed. You know, I've had trees that were planted and, you know, they die, they get replaced. Um, the community, um, I do construction, I work uh, for Habitat for Humanity, um, so I know a little about home building, but uh, my wife and I take our dog around the neighborhood at least three times a day, so I see myself as sort of the building inspector <laughs> and watch the construction as it is going on. Um, one of the cleanest job sites I've, I've ever seen. The community is very well maintained. Um, um, the issue of traffic, um, well, you know, the only time we have problems with traffic is in the community when we have all of these contractors coming in building these homes. But uh, over the 22 months, they built 100 homes, um, and they're built they're built quickly, but they're built well because they're a very well coordinated system, um, and they move from one to the other to the other. Uh, the amenities that people talked about, we bought when the amenities were not approved when phase two um, and the amenities had not been approved um, with the understanding that looking at what we were seeing, we knew what would happen because of what we had seen. Um, I do make use, I'll leave here and go back to the model and get on the exercise bike um, because they've tried to provide some sort of bridge to when those amenities are available. Um, the other um, the the other time, oh, I'm your time's up. I'm sorry. You see, I'm a bit of an enthusiast. Uh, but that's great. But that's I great. appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I'm looking forward to watching the progress. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Jody Schultz, who is uh, waiting for us in the uh, hallway. Jody, <laughs> Good morning, Jody Schultz, uh, Ken Island. Um, I guess I'm really here with two hats on. I just wanted to uh, um, thank Mike and Four Seasons for their contributions to the, to the Ken Island Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, he had showed you a slide that showed the contributions that they've made, which helped us to purchase our um, rescue truck. You don't need to wear that if you which helped us to, to purchase our rescue truck. 
Um, it sounded like a lot of money, which it was in his slide, but that new rescue truck cost us over a million dollars. So um, without that contribution, we probably wouldn't have been able to replace that truck um, as quickly as we had. That was 30 years old. So we want to thank them for that. And we don't really, we try not to get into the habit of, you know, giving our support or whatever to developments. We don't really live in that world. But the fact is that when they bring those many people and uh, which is traffic and homes and <clears throat> to our area that we have to um, account for that. And we, we meet often about all these, all the stuff that's going on on Kent Island and the fact that they stepped up early on. I mean, years ago, they stepped up early on and uh, we worked out this contribution to us, really said a lot about them and they've uh, met all their obligations. And we've actually been able to raise the contributions from the homeowners association from where we started because the project was delayed so much. So that's just gonna help us continue to be able to, to provide our services and replace our equipment. And it's particularly uh, important now with COVID and our fundraisers have been pretty much eliminated. Um, all fire departments uh, fundraisers have been eliminated. So we really wanna thank Mike and his group for, for acknowledging and it's it's just a good example how you know the local fire departments and developers can kind of can work together so i want to thank him for that so um as a local um resident and business person i just see four seasons as being a a big um, um addition to our community financially they're gonna they're gonna, those people are going to go to the local hardware stores, the restaurants. They're also, in my opinion, going to contribute to all the nonprofits that we all try to support, the hospices and the Chester Wise and all these groups now that are also suffering. So it's my experience with those types of people in that age and that development. They really understand at that point in their life how important it is to give back. We're hoping to get some of those people as uh, auxiliary members of our department. So... Um, you know, I hope you, in that respect, approve their last two phases. Um, I think they've been beat up enough for the last 20 years and certainly weathered the storm. And um, I, I look forward to, to not a half-completed project, but a, but a completed project. I think they've certainly passed the smell tests, um, at least for, for most of us. So. Time. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next is it's Steve, correct? Steve Donovan? How are you? Good morning. Oh, thank you. Sure. Well, I like what Jody said. Can you just repeat what he said and just put that in for me? Uh, Steve Donovan, um, I served three terms on Economic Development Commission, just came off of that. Business Queen Anns, we're in a bizarre virtual world like everybody else right now. Uh, we've been supportive of this project since, since I got over in this area, 2007. Um, all the reasons Jody said as an individual resident, what Four Seasons will bring. Um, but on a personal level, me driving down, every time I go down that way, I drive through and just look what's going on. And it just, it's, it's clean. It's, it's, it just, it's, it's moving well. It's moving consistently. All their promises. Every time I see the, uh, information that's put up there about, uh, how much they've contributed above and beyond, uh, not just money, uh, but, uh, but uh, things for the environment, the storm water, that type of thing. I mean, I just, everything I see is uh, somebody that wants to be here, make it the best thing they've got, and use it as a showcase for their business. So uh, very supportive of it, want to continue to be that way. I think it's a, a plus. And then Jody's whole last part from being the individual resident, just put that in for me, too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, ready to move on to Zoom. I just want to let everyone know we do have 50 people almost waiting in Zoom, and we only have nine people signed up for comment. So if you still would like to make comment, please turn on your video and at least raise your hand. Let us know that you're there, unless you've already spoken to Chris and he's cleared you. So we're going to get started with our first, which is Mr. Robert Baylor. I'm going to ask you to unmute, and please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Robert Baylor. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. All right, I am the, um, wow, that picture looks bad. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway um, I am the uh, homeowner service director for Chaos Mania Homes, and I deal with a lot of the homeowners in the community, and I know how I hear about all the exciting things, and usually we deal with all the 
problems with homes, you know, little repairs and stuff like that. But you always get into these side discussions about the community, and, and they really are looking forward to seeing this community get to where it needs to go and to completion. So they're very excited. Um, they do talk to us a lot about the community, um, and, and that's something that I did want to throw out there. It's also very important to me and my staff, the trades that work in there, the jobs that they have, um, the materials that we get, it's really good for the economy. So I, you know, that that's all I really had to say. It's not much, but I think it's 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 a valid point. Thank you. All right, uh, next, we're going to move to Jason Smith. Please introduce yourself, Jason. I ask you to unmute. My name is Jason Smith. Good morning, commissioners. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, my name is Jason Smith. I'm a Queen Anne's County resident, live in Southersville. Um, I not only live and play in Queen Anne's County, but King Health Maintenance Four Seasons Project has allowed me and my company, Dennis and Landscaping, the opportunity to work in Queen Anne's County. In addition to working there, we also hire local labor from Queen Anne's County to support their project. I am in support of the approval of phases three and four of the project. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we're going to move on to Stephanie Faust. I'm going to ask you to unmute Stephanie. Good morning slash afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Faust. Um, I am the homeowner service manager for the Kent Island community. So yes, of course, I am here to speak in support and on behalf of the continued development with K Havnanian. I have been lucky enough to be part of this project for quite some time, worked directly with all my homeowners. So I'm gonna let them speak for themselves this afternoon um, because I know some of them are waiting in chat rooms to call, to, uh, to, to, to talk. Um, but I will say, of course, you know, as well as having a job there, we are kind of a Kent Island family. Not uh, Four Seasons is very important to continue the growth. Um, I've met some of the kindest and most wonderful people and it is an asset um, that I'm very proud to be part of and a family that I'm very proud to be part of to work and continue to work and possibly retire either to or from my wonderful community and Kent Island people. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next up is Dylan Allen. I'm going to ask you to unmute, please, Dylan. Hi, my name is Dylan Allen. I am the newest assistant community construction manager here at Uh I think this is a great opportunity for the, uh, the whole community. Uh, it's not only helping people who work for Kavnanian, but all the subcontractors and then uh, the community around it. I think it's a Great thing for the Eastern Shore and the surrounding areas. Um, and I'm 100% in support of this. Uh, that's really all I have. I know it's not much, but at the same time, I think it's uh, a great point and it's gonna help the community tremendously. Thank you. All right, next up is going to be Annie Richards. I've asked you to unmute Annie. Richards. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm new to this position. I'm the Chester Riverkeeper for Shore Rivers. However, my predecessor captured numerous photos of major sediment runoff into the Chester and its tributaries during phase one and two of the construction of these communities. So I urge the commissioners to tighten regulations and surveillance regarding best management practices for construction runoff management in third and fourth phases. Um, I've also submitted a written testimony, so I won't repeat anything that I have submitted previous to this hearing. I'm merely speaking to things that have arisen during the meeting at hand. Um, the clearing of established woodlands to make room for stormwater management techniques does not seem reasonable uh, in an island that has been you know, so developed and we've lost so much wetlands already, which is necessary transitional area to absorb the numerous stormwater runoff effects that are going to result from the expansion of this community. Um, and everything else that I have to say about this is submitted in my written testimony. Thank you. 
All right, next is going to be uh, Dylan Sammons. Can you please unmute Good morning. Dylan? My name is, <clears throat> yep. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Dylan Sammons, and um, I work in the sales center at uh, Four Seasons at Ken Island selling the condominiums. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity um, that has presented me and my family. Um, Mike Irons and the rest of the management do a great job at uh, just providing a, a happy and a safe work environment. And um, I also have the pleasure of speaking with the homeowners of the community on a daily basis. So I know they're very, very excited for phases uh, three and four. And um, I'll keep it short because I know we have a lot of people talking, but yeah, very great <coughs> opportunity. And I look forward to phase three and four. Okay, thank you. Hey, Dylan. All right, next up is going to be Gene Wagbo. I'm going to ask you to unmute, please, Gene. Great. Hi. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gene Wagbo, and I'm a resident of Bayside. Uh, I seem to be in the minority represented here today, but thanks to the commissioners and uh, for all of the uh, presentations, which had a really nice level of detail. Um, I submitted questions earlier, uh, and one of those questions related to a uh, traffic study, if it had been updated. So I was glad to hear when the presentation began that the traffic study had been updated. And then I was aghast. In 2020, it was updated during a pandemic when people were working remotely, schools were closed, businesses closed, restaurants closed, people were asked to be home. How can that be taken seriously, that, that traffic count? Um, we have a, a safety issue along Castle Marina. Now there's a boulevard. Uh, there's there's no there's high curves when we need emergency vehicles to come back here on days that there's gridlock or heavy traffic around the the the, the uh, Route A Castle Marina Circle. How will vehicles get back to reach us? Um, I just I want the county to start taking this traffic issue seriously. Uh, Ma'am, I think Mr. Schmid uh, testified that the updated traffic counts were from 2019. 2019, but then you mentioned you mentioned 2020. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, thank you for your clarification. <laughs> oh, you, got, you had me going. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that I really, um, uh, as far as I understand, the DRRA expires in 2022 where phase three and phase four would not be, have, have begun yet. So I think that the county needs to reconsider uh, engaging in approving this before the DRRA is renegotiated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next public comment is going to be from Steve. I apologize, Steve, there's no last name, but could you please introduce yourself and unmute? Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, Steve Layton here. I live at 309 Windsor Avenue in Centerville. Uh, I'm going to just read a prepared statement, otherwise I tend to ramble a little bit. Um, so speaking as the project manager for uh, Macron uh, for Four Seasons Phase 1, I'd just like to say that this is one of the projects I'm most proud to be associated with. Kavnanian has been a pleasure to work with uh, because they're knowledgeable and willing to do what it takes to build a, a quality product. I think the results are evident in what they've built so far. Speaking as a resident of Queen Anne's County, I welcome the expansion of the project because it brings in the type of residents that we need in the county and the money they spend will support our local businesses and trades. I believe the infrastructure improvements and financial contributions they have made and continue to make will offset the negative impacts from development. Uh, the developer has gone over and above the local and state regulations and has kept up their side of the DRRA. It's important for the county to, to follow through on its commitments as well. So I respectfully ask that you vote to approve this project. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next public comment comes from Rebecca Mazzullo. I'm going to ask you to unmute, please. Are you there, Rebecca? Right. Uh, we can come back to Rebecca if we want after I do. I have, she was the last one on Zoom, but I do have some emails. Well, let's go through the emails and then we'll try Rebecca one sure more thing. time. Okay. Our first email today comes from Gail Worley. 
I represent Treadstone Hardscapes LLC. We are a small business in QAC and have spoken in favor in the past for the development. We continue our support of this development in the next phases. They're following guidelines required by the county and are bringing well-needed income to the county and small businesses. Our next email comes from Mark Steeman. My name is Mark Steeman. 20 years ago, I signed the DRRA on behalf of K. Ovenian. Over the years, K. Ovenian has, all, has honored every commitment made to QAC. The positive fiscal impact for the county cannot be overstated. I respectfully recommend the commission approve the final phases of this first-class community. Our next comment is from Eric Boone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Boone. I am the, the project manager for Gaines & Company, Inc., we are contracted as one of the major site development firms for Phase 2 of the Four Seasons Project. We are also the selected contractor for Phase 1. Of our 260 employees company-wide, three of our mainline crew leaders and several laborers and operators reside in the local county and other areas of Maryland's eastern shore. Our current company vice president resides in Chestertown, Maryland. The project has proven in the past to be an important part of our business plan and annual revenue. Most importantly, we continue to provide local revenue to other trade sub subtractors subcontractors in the immediate area who supply services and materials such as labor and equipment, sand and aggregate products, and many other site and infrastructure related materials. We continue to support local businesses such as hotels for weekly lodging, local delis for daily lunches, and restaurants for evening meals during overnight stays. I would like to point out that the project comes with challenges during adverse weather patterns. This summer alone had its moments to say the least. I commend our crews and especially the development team and their environmental support contractors. The continuing efforts to protect the critical outfall areas and tributaries have been outstanding. The project team has repeatedly maintained an above-average standard with the local and state-level inspection agencies. We firmly believe that this is an extremely important task for the current and future phases, and many steps above local and state requirements are in place to continue the protection of the environment. On behalf of the Four Seasons Development Team and our workforce, please continue to support the approval for Phase 3 and 4. The approval allows the project to continue to be successful for all involved. Our next email comes from uh, Alton McIntosh. Greetings to all and thanks for, re for relaying my comments. My name is Alton McIntosh, 321 South Lake Drive, Stevensville, Maryland. As a QAC resident of over 30 years, I continue to be supportive of all the full competition of this project. I think it is a shining example of what true plan growth can look like, and those visitors, those visitors using the Cross Island Trail get this great takeaway from our county. I appreciate the patience that K. Hovenian has extended to QAC through all the numerous delays to moving forward with our project. Aside from the K. Hovenian property investment, there was a firehouse, a water tower, a road improvement, and much more that has benefited many county residents. I also believe that upon completion, the stormwater runoff from this property into local creeks and rivers will ultimately be less than the farm that once worked this land. I have spoken of this project many times among my fellow county residents, and they now represent the silent majority who agree QAC made the right moves allowing construction to move ahead. A small group of anti-growth residents have abused and exhausted the QAC courts and appeals process, and I sincerely ask that my tax dollars not go towards allowing them to continue. Thanks. I appreciate my voice being heard. Our next email comes from Heather Williamson, and she is an attached uh, PDF. One second. Okay, great. Still like me to read it aloud, though? Well, we've, uh, we've seen it. Okay, so. no problem. Then our next email is going to come from Angela Rice. Actually, it comes from Chris Toller. Sorry. Is Since this, Chris Toller. Okay. Since the start of the Cahavini and Kent Island Four Seasons community, we have been able to hire local labor versus bringing labor and employees from the other side of the bridge. I have also been able to work in Kent Island myself instead of driving over the bridge daily for work. This brings added revenue to the local economy and small businesses in the area. Thank you for your time and consideration. Our final email comes from Ken Baxter. Greetings. Our names are Ken and Stephanie Baxter. My wife and I recently contracted to have a house built in the Four Seasons subdivision. My family has been a part of Kent Island for over 60 years. My uncle, Captain Earl Seward, built Seward's Marina, which included the Poseidon Inn and Restaurant Inn. There were the days when we could go gunning up for ducks, go rock fishing in the Narrows, and tong for oysters, and finish the day with a cold beverage at the Kent Island Yacht Club, Elks Club, or American Legion off Route 8, depending on the preference at the time. But times have changed. We were originally opposed to the development proposed by K. Havenian over 20 years ago, but as you age, your attitude towards progress and development change. My wife and I recently sold our Eastern Bay waterfront house in Romacoke to our daughter. We are just too old. I am now 71 years of age. 
to keep, it the, to keep up the house, the land, and the pier. We also own buildable land in Kent Island States, but decide not to build. We will be on a private well in Septic and too far away from basic services such as grocery stores and medical facilities. In order to stay on the island, we need to find a subdivision which catered to seniors. Four Seasons fits the lifestyle we were looking for, so we contracted to have a new house built with delivery scheduled towards the end of May. There are a lot of families and friends in the area who are now at the age when they need to gravitate towards a low-maintenance lifestyle while still remaining in the area they love. The timing is right for a subdivision like Four Seasons to be built to serve those seniors who now require this type of maintenance-free lifestyle. We looked at other options such as Delaware and Florida. Those two states have succeeded in supplying the housing needs for seniors. With Four Seasons meeting our needs, we decided to stay in the area. Please approve Phase 3 and Phase 4 so that others in the area of Queens County and folks coming from outside the area will have the option to live on, the, on Kent Island. Thanks. That concludes our emails. I'm going to uh, come back over and try Rebecca Mazula one more time. Uh, Rebecca, I'm going to ask you to unmute once more, if you could please. Are you there, Rebecca? Okay. Right. And we did have one more as I was doing emails, Ed. Uh, we do have Lolita uh, Watkins, if she's there. So if Lolita, if you're there, could you please make comment? I am here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lolita Justice Watkins. I am a resident of Queen Anne's County, as well as uh, an employee of Four Seasons at Kent Island. Um, my husband and I moved here from Howard County more than 15 years ago. And for 10 of those years, I commuted across the Bay Bridge to Baltimore for work. Um, so I'm very grateful to be employed by Four Seasons at Kent Island. We welcome them here. My husband and I also have a small business here, so we are grateful that we're here and we're able to spend more time with our families. I ask uh, that you would approve phases three and four. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it, Bruce? That is. Uh, we did have a comment in. Um, oh. Hi, I'm a sales consultant um, at Four Seasons. My name is Rebecca Mazzullo. Um, I'm a resident of Queen Anne's County, and I support Four Seasons. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, that is all. Uh, I did have a comment in the chat from Annie. Annie was uh, the one that spoke and said that she submitted, uh, but you guys got that, right? Yes. How, how would that have gotten to us? In the, in, the, uh, in the email. She sent a letter in addition to her comments. I was getting ready to ask where those written comments were. I did not receive them if they did. I'll when... them to your email. I'll make you a copy. Thank you. Okay. I think... Um, also in that same vein, um, the Department of Planning and Zoning received comments from um, Jesse Hammock, an attorney uh, with Parker Coons, and that had been forwarded to you for your review as well. Right, I was going to mention, put that in the record. Um, we received the 19-page document this morning from Parker Counts, Parker Goodman, Gordon, and Hammock, LLC, Attorneys at Law. Please show on the record that we received it. Make it part of the meeting. But Bruce, there's no one from on Zoom representing that those written comments from Parker Counts Coons. Uh, not that I see. If if there is someone, if you could turn on your video and just wave so we know you're there, but I have not seen that come up yet. As Madam Chair points out, it's a lot to digest when we first get it, when we first walk in. I was just wondering if there's a an executive summary that could be delivered verbally. Well, it's looking like not. Well, and uh, if um, if if it would help, um, in summary, they're looking for three conditions to be added. Um, I can address the first condition that that um, during the presentation there was some detail about um, cut and fill in the floodplain, and they asked that it be clear that there'll be replanting of that area and that's what the revised plans reflect you know they, that that area will be mr griffith stated that they will not allow to naturally regenerate they will actively replant that's right. correct there's a planting plan that goes along with that as well um what was their second one the second one was uh they believe that the wetland license had a time of year restriction that applied to the entire project um, the county has not applied it that way, and we don't believe it is applied that way to the entire project. 
The wetland license is specific to pier construction and the sewer line construction. That's what the wetland license has jurisdiction over. And the way the county has implemented it is that the time of year restrictions applies to the pier construction and the drilling of the water line or the sewer line at the time that that happened. The other, uh, the third point was that the stormwater management of the project be maintained and by the homeowners association and not by the county and that's going to happen it's, it's not the county's responsibility to maintain the on-site stormwater management we'll periodically inspect it and um, direct the community to repair it if necessary um, but the county will not be financially responsible for the stormwater management um, in the future so that that's a um, uh, it, it, we just aren't could add, Madam Chair. <laughs> Down or wrong? Uh, just the covenants provide for that, which have been reviewed by Mr. Drummond and a part of the uh, right. land records. That's all I was going to add. So they've all been resolved, evidently. Well, uh, that's okay. how the counties uh, dealt with the, the issues they've brought up. You know, I'm not representing them, and I'm not, um, you know, I'm just, those, those were the things that were brought up. Uh, two of them are clearly satisfied, and, and I explained how we dealt with the uh, third. Uh, Any other comments? Uh, uh, Annie did reach out again in chat. Uh, I guess she, I guess she thought the whole thing that she uh, submit would be read. She just asked if she could make more comments in addition. Okay. okay. All right, Annie, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, just give me one second. She to is find limited you. to three minutes. Who, who is this? This is uh, Annie Richards. I'm sorry, I just got to find your name again, Annie. So Queen. Anne. I just ask you to unmute, please. Thanks so much. So, Annie Richards here again. I'm the Chester River Keeper with Shore Rivers. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on the proposed concept plans after reviewing the related documents. We urge the commissioners to consider our recommendations. Uh, are you checking the time? Well, the stormwater runoff generated by this development will have profound negative impacts on the Chester River and will be overwhelming to the transitional lands and marshes left standing once construction is complete. While 85.69 acres of protected woodland is a start to mitigating runoff, it is not the best management practice available. As the Chester River Keeper, I am advocating for no further deforestation to occur for the implementation of this development. Removal of swaths of trees for the sake of improved water views, as outlined in Section K, is not an acceptable trade for the last remaining natural buffers in the area and implore the commissioners to protect all currently existing woodlands. The buffer management plan provided seems to be based on the critical area commission recommendations from 2004. In the last 18 years, there have been significant advantages, advances and changes in data regarding climate change and sea level rise, as well as the measurable positive benefits of allowing existing, existing marshes room to migrate as sea level changes occur. I advocate today for a 300 foot minimum buffer around the entire proposed community. The proposed 150-foot buffer areas will not be enough to ensure the future resiliency of the community, nor will it protect our rivers from improperly treated stormwater runoff when flooding occurs. To, future ease the to further ease the stormwater impact in the Chester watershed, I propose the commissioners require all parking lots, spaces, driveways to be constructed with permeable materials to the highest possible extent, complemented by bioretention basins and swales, and with a native species landscape plan in place to provide substantial canopy cover for any roads or lots built with impermeable materials. I strongly urge you to reconsider the plan as currently proposed. This is a pivotal time for Queen Anne's County with the revisioning of their comprehensive plan during a time when our communities must accept the certainty of negative impacts from climate change. It is unreasonable for the county to to allow the removal of wetlands and increase impervious service development on Ken Island without mandating robust and comprehensive strategies to be adopted by the permit applicant to mitigate the loss of the benefits provided by that ecosystem. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, next on the agenda is a um, Resolution for final subdivision. Madam Chair, just one clarifying question I can of Mr. Cahoon. So it's this, realizing Mr. Cahoon, you're not a, an attorney, uh, but it's the county attorney's 
interpretation of this Exhibit 2 as provided by uh, Mr. Hammock. Uh, the Board of Public Works Wetland License uh, 0706 deals only with the directional boring of water and sewer lines, whatever infrastructure that, as well as the pier, and not the uh, clearing that Mr. Griffiths spoke about, the cut and fill, and that Ms. Richards uh, is is voicing concerns over, is that correct? The, um, that's correct. The, the wetland license, um, well, let me. That's correct. That's all the, that's what the Board of Public Works approved. It was okay. disturbances to uh, wet, tidal wetlands um, for, uh, I thought there was a couple of outfalls in, yeah, in the, uh, in the wetlands license, there's a couple of outfalls up here. And what was the other thing you mentioned? Oh, well, Mr. Mr. Griffith uh, outlined the cut and fill. Well, that's not in a wetland. That's, uh, that was my next follow up right. question. All right. Okay. I just I wanted clarification because right. we, we literally just got this and I'm trying to and the, trying to interpret what's what's in front of us. The uh, um, back to the wetlands that were associated with the with the bridge have gone away because right. I couldn't get that approval, right. which uh, I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that uh, the K, the Four Seasons representative says that that's a donation to the county. Well, they didn't, they couldn't do much else with it, but give it to the county after the state turned them down. So, right. okay. I just want to be clear on the, on the interpretation and the, the standing the, of the information as I understand. That's all. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so now I would like to entertain a resolution for final subdivision approval. Then I will do it. Be it resolved that the Planning Commission regarding the request by K. Hovanians Four Seasons at Ken Island to LLC for 374 single family lots and associated open space lots as phase three and four of the proposed 1,079 dwelling unit age restricted community and is more particularly described in Department of Planning and Zoning file SP 19-06-27-C hereby fines. Um, and grants final subdivision approval. Any remaining edits and or documents required by the Department of Public Works and Department of Planning and Zoning be reviewed and approved. All required bond sureties review and inspection fees must be submitted to the Department of Public Works and the Department of Planning and Zoning as appropriate. Any required legal documents must be approved, signed and recorded, and all required signatures must be obtained. And I have a second. Second. Second by Teddy Baker. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Is Jeff still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I didn't hear you. Did you say aye? Aye. Okay. Aye. Any opposed? Abstain. Okay, final, um, final site plan approval, condominium building? Yes, sir. No, I was, somebody asked who that was. I thought it was Sharon. Oh. Who Lee. Tom Lee. Tom Lee. I'll go I'll continue. Resolve that the Planning Commission regarding the request by K. Hovanians Four Seasons at Ken Island 2 LLC for 294 condominium units in 21 multifamily buildings as phase three and four of the proposed 1,079 dwelling unit age restricted community and is more particularly described in Department of Planning and Zoning file SP 19-06-27-C hereby fines and grants final site approval with the following conditions. Any remaining edits and or documents required by the Department of Public Works 
and Department of Planning and Zoning be reviewed and approved. All required bond, sureties, review, and inspection fees must be submitted to the Department of Public Works and Department of Planning and Zoning as appropriate. Any required legal documents must be approved, signed, and recorded, and all required signatures must be obtained. May I get a second? Second. Kathy, do you have a second? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Tom, Tom Lee abstained again. I think you're finished. Thank you. Safe travels. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Good luck. Are we still having the planned workshop, do you know? For the complaint, I thought so. Are they here? Uh, they're in Zoom. Uh, they're, they're in the Zoom meeting. They're attending virtually today okay. because of the weather, but we are having it. Okay. All right, let's take a break, five-minute break.
Mr. Lawyer. <laughs> Let's go back in the session, please, <laughs> so we can get on with the day. <laughs> we good, Ted? All right, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, comprehensive Plan Workshop. Lauren Good and Ray Moravec of Wallace Montgomery will lead the commission in a comprehensive plan mm -hmm. work session. We're turning it over to you, Lauren. Hey, sounds good. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having us uh, with you today virtually. Um, roads were a little uh, snowy and icy, so we appreciate this opportunity to join you over Zoom. Uh, as you just mentioned, uh, we are uh, going to be providing this uh, update uh, on the status of the uh, planning process uh, to date, uh, and then uh, talking more specifically about the plan's uh, draft third chapter, which has a focus on community facilities and services. Uh, at our last uh, at our last meeting, uh, one of the things that we talked about uh, was uh, really how we are reaching out to the county's residents, uh, businesses, and um, other stakeholders. Uh, so we wanted to just provide this brief overview of some of the different outreach efforts uh, that have been going on uh, since uh, since the January meeting. Uh, so those include. Um, uh, scheduling all of the. So hold on, uh, hold on, uh, hold on a second, Lauren. Is is the rest of the committees in there? Is Sharon on and and um, Jeff? Uh, and we do have Sharon Brinster on. Uh, I have not Kathy seen Kathy or there we go. There's uh, Jeff's on. I haven't seen Kathy restart hers yet or uh, Arthur. There we go. Art's on. Yeah. Kathy Diotis is on. Okay, good. We're back in session. <laughs> okay, and Lauren, I would ask you, um, rather than read every word that's on the, these uh, bullets, can we just do like a summary of them? Definitely. Okay, that would be appreciated. Um, uh, so we have uh, scheduled all of the different uh, outreach meetings throughout the remainder of the process uh, until we get to that, um, the adoption phase. Uh, so that information is all on the website, uh, and we have started more actively uh, reaching out to uh, various uh, organizations, uh, as well as uh, those who are interested in uh, having project updates. Uh, so they're getting uh, regular updates about status uh, and upcoming meetings. Uh, so we've, we've just been using a few different venues to uh, try to, uh, to do that uh, through email, social media, um, and um, working with uh, some of the different county departments uh, to get information about the project um, out more into the public sphere. Um, in that column on the right, uh, you can see that we, we've had uh, quite a few uh, interactions uh, with the public on our project website uh, with over 2,300 uh, distinct page views. Uh, so that's great to hear and that that number just keeps going up uh, and then also uh, we've had a number of the uh, questions of the week uh, since the project started um, and those uh, responses are ratcheting up as we move forward throughout the process so we uh, anticipate that we will continue to get uh, greater numbers of responses um, and then of course it will depend on the the particular topic itself Uh, and then speaking of questions of the week, um, the uh, second uh, batch of questions uh, was focusing more on uh, park and recreation facilities. Uh, so we were just asking uh, for the three factors that are most important to people when they decide to visit park or recreation facility. Um, and the top three responses uh, were that the facilities are well-maintained uh, that they're convenient and that uh, the facilities and surrounding areas are safe and secure. Uh, similarly, we asked um, uh, people what three facilities they plan to use in the next year. Uh, and the top three responses were uh, Conquest, uh, the Terrapin Nature Area, uh, and then a tie for the Mattapique Clubhouse and Public Beach, as well as the uh, public landings and boat launches. 
Uh, we do have some additional uh, questions of the week that are that are ongoing, um, but they're still in progress. So we'll provide uh, those updates uh, to you at your your next meeting. Uh, some of the uh, the commission were able to participate in the uh, visioning workshops that we have held so far. Uh, we've held four of them, and the last one in the series uh, is occurring later on tonight. Uh, so that will be held virtually at, starting at 5.30 p.m. Uh, each of these visioning workshops uh, had sort of a split focus, uh, one being looking at the county as a whole, uh, and then the other at a particular uh, community area. Uh, so we have had uh, a good number of uh, participants in these workshops ranging from um, in the, the mid 30s to over 50. Uh, so that's that's really uh, great to uh, to see that. Uh, and we've been having a lot of good uh, conversations and comments uh, coming in, uh, whether they are being um, spoken aloud or through a chat room um, or, or things like that, much like uh, these meetings are occurring. Uh, so each of these uh, workshops, uh, we had a number of uh, discussion topics that really tried to focus in on what people thought the uh, different opportunities and challenges were uh, for both that uh, countywide as well as the particular uh, geographic area. Um, we also discussed um, any, uh, we're calling them big ideas that participants may have, um, just you know, things that either pop into their mind or they've been thinking about uh, for a longer period of time that these might be um, uh, something good to incorporate or for the county to consider um, in that uh, the next 10 years of the, uh, the uh, planning implementation phase. Uh, and then we wrapped up each of those different uh, workshops uh, by uh, really trying to highlight what participants thought the uh, different priorities were uh, related to uh, the visioning um, when thinking about um, those opportunities, challenges, and ideas. Uh, so here uh, on these uh, on these slides are just really um, very high level, um, uh, quick word or two that really summarizes the main topics that were discussed. Um, we are going to be putting uh, one page summaries uh, for each of these visioning workshops on the project website, uh, and then we'll have uh, some more detailed information and specifics uh, uh, for the uh, for your next meeting that is able to incorporate uh, all five workshops uh, comments and responses. Uh, while we did have that focus on the uh, different planning areas throughout the county, there were uh, several topics that kept um, coming up regardless of the, uh, the actual workshop. Um, and uh, a lot of those related to affordable housing or um, uh, good uh, educational opportunities, um, uh, local, local jobs, um, uh, challenges uh, surrounding traffic um, and uh, broadband uh, access. Um, and uh, there were a number of ideas that focused on uh, preparing for climate change or resiliency um, or how rising sea levels and increasing storms uh, may affect uh, some of the uh, lower lying or um, uh, coastal areas of the county. Uh, and then again, um, building off of those uh, priorities being um, uh, providing that affordable or workforce housing, um, looking at uh, sewer capacities, uh, provision of broadband, uh, preserving appropriate land, um, and having uh, focused development areas. Um, similarly, on this slide, you'll see uh, a lot of those same topics um, that uh, sort of weave their way through them. Um, so it is, it's good to see that uh, um, there's, uh, we're, we're starting to narrow in on those, um, those true priority areas um, and we are incorporating those into the plan as we move forward. Um, and then uh, last, uh, or yesterday afternoon, we held our first special topic workshop uh, and uh, whereas the visioning workshops uh, really look uh, more comprehensively at, uh, at the county, 
these special topic workshops are looking at particular uh, topic areas um, closely aligned with the different chapters in the plan itself. Uh, so the workshop that we held yesterday, uh, again, focused on community facilities uh, and services uh, and uh, had uh, some more general conversations about uh, countywide assets or needs, um, uh, some you know, identified as um, uh, the library and school systems being great assets, uh, the um, uh, non-automotive transportation facilities, uh, waterways, uh, and then uh, needs that were identified, uh, a lot of them were related to connectivity, um, or uh, providing uh, opportunities for uh, VOTEC or um, technology-based uh, education, um, places for people to meet, um, looking at the um, uh, adequate public facilities, uh, ordinances, and uh, things of that nature. Uh, this workshop then went into more specifics about uh, the various uh, specific topic areas in the uh, in that chapter. Uh, so for community facilities, really focusing on public safety, uh, education and libraries, uh, and then parks and recreation. Uh, so again here, just really uh, pinpointing where people um, thought there were priorities. Um, again, you see that uh, traffic is, uh, as, as I'm sure you all guessed, uh, one of those recurring themes. Um, and then uh, just making sure that the different uh, facilities and services are in place to serve a um, uh, multi-age and um, uh, uh, multi-ability audience, if you will. Um, and we had uh, two um, particular poll questions where we um, were just asking, you know, what do people really wish uh, they had in, in the county? Um, and it was really interesting, the range of uh, uh, responses that we got everywhere from composting facilities to uh, reliable internet and um, non-automotive transportation options and everywhere in between. Um, and then a follow-up question that um, if the county had uh, this type of facility, um, it would really um, make them want to stay in the county and, uh, for example, not look for, not look to move out of the county. Uh, so some of those, uh, those responses included uh, some cultural uh, opportunities like museums and public gardens, um, as well as um, uh, more in different park facilities um, or making sure that the, uh, there's a good enough water quality for people to, uh, to swim in it. Uh, we will have a number of additional special topic workshops uh, throughout the next uh, several months. Um, so uh, all of these are uh, posted to the project website and uh, more information is coming out as we get a little bit closer to each of those meetings. Uh, and then with that, I'm just going to uh, jump right into um, uh, really the focus of this uh, of this workshop, and that is looking at that draft of community facilities and services chapter. Uh, so overall, uh, the chapter uh, uh, has a um, uh, sort of a, a one page informational, su informational summary. Um, and this is something that you will see in future chapters as well. Uh, where uh, right up front, uh, the vision, key issues, uh, themes, and major goals are identified. Uh, so if, um, if someone is interested but has, uh, doesn't have the time to read more than just that one page, they can at least get that uh, really quick glimpse into uh, what people are thinking about uh, related to community facilities and services. Um, you will all uh, note the, the copy of the draft that you received. Um, those key issues and plan themes uh, were still in progress uh, because we uh, were not able to hold the special topic workshop until yesterday. Uh, also had a, a meeting with our technical committee, uh, which is comprised mainly of um, uh, representatives from the various county departments. Uh, so we are um, 
compiling all of that information um, and we have some additional uh, follow-up conversations scheduled um, that will help us to uh, finalize um, this, this document. Um, and um, as with the previous chapters, um, this is uh, this is just sort of a, a first uh, first glance at it to get um, to get your initial feedback, and then we will need to refine the various uh, topics moving forward. Um, as we move on past that uh, uh, sort of one page summary of the chapter, uh, we uh, start providing uh, more information on uh, the different uh, principles and legislative background that really uh, serve to inform the topic. Uh, for instance, in this case, um, there, there's definitely that focus on adequate public facilities. Um, we're also incorporating uh, some of the major uh, points of public input that we've heard uh, both from the visioning workshops, uh, special topic workshops, as well as from the community survey that was done uh, back in the fall of uh, 2019, or at least, at least started at that point. Um, and then um, we uh, will continue to refine these um, uh, throughout the next several months um, as new information comes in from various sources. Uh, after that, we really get into uh, more the specifics about these different uh, facilities and services that are provided within the county. First, taking a look at uh, really its, its governance and structure and what, um, what uh, makes up uh, the, county, the county government, um, as well as uh, what um, uh, non-county uh, agencies um, are, uh, are represented. Uh, then taking a look at uh, public safety facilities and services um, and uh, providing background on, um, on those different facilities and services um, and then uh, having a discussion of where uh, those, uh, where some, what some of those needs are and opportunities um, uh, to be uh, uh, utilized in the future. Um, we do have a, um, another meeting scheduled uh, with the uh, Department of Emergency Services um, to flesh out some additional information for that section. Uh, so that is one area where uh, we will be incorporating uh, some additional information for the, uh, the next version of the draft itself. Um, the next uh, subtopic uh, talks briefly about um, different utility facilities and services, uh, so water and wastewater, uh, telecommunications, things like that. Uh, one uh, difference between this, uh, this update and the 2010 plan is that we're really trying to concentrate information in one, uh, one area of the plan, uh, so you don't uh, really need to look in multiple places to find some more information. Uh, so while the 2010 plan did have um, a little bit more information in this section related to uh, water and wastewater facilities, um, those are really being discussed uh, more completely as part of the um, environmental uh, chapter, which incorporates the um, water resources element that is a requirement uh, by the state. Um, the, the draft then moves on to talk about uh, different educational facilities and services everywhere from the uh, public school system uh, to those, um, uh, some of those uh, different areas like the, um, the VOTEC or, or other uh, opportunities. Um, and then looking at the higher education uh, opportunities that are available within the county. Uh, tied closely to that are the library facilities and services um, and just highlighting um, highlighting those in conjunction um, and uh, sort of laying out those existing conditions um, and uh, future expectations for for those different uh, components um, one more uh, area where uh, there is a uh, uh, requirement um, from from the state is uh, looking at the open space and recreation uh, facilities and services. Uh, so that's incorporated uh, in this chapter as well. Uh, and that's looking at everything from 
uh, parks and open space to recreation programs um, and uh, public uh, public water access uh, launches or um, or marinas. Uh, we uh, have some uh, follow-up conversations that are uh, going to be taking place uh, because the county is um, uh, sort of in a, a similar uh, timeline also working on the um, land preservation parks and recreation plan, uh, which uh, that draft is, uh, I believe that that is anticipated for fall of this year. Uh, so working with that department to um, so that we can integrate information uh, that they're preparing for that draft uh, and then vice versa. Uh, so that we have, uh, we both have the most uh, up-to-date information as possible uh, on those different topics. Um, and then the, the last uh, couple of uh, components of these drafts are um, looking at any best management practices, tools, or techniques. Uh, so that's one of those areas where You'll see that uh, moving forward in other chapters, any of those that we um, want to highlight or um, think could provide some additional clarity on, um, on any of the incorporated information. Uh, and then uh, really wrapping up the overall chapter with uh, a, um, a list of the, uh, the goals, so reiterating those that, um, that you see on that first uh, one page uh, summary sheet, uh, but then providing additional information in the form of uh, different strategies and actions that the county can take over the next, uh, uh, the county and its partners could take over the next uh, 10, 10 years to, um, to help meet those, those goals, um, uh, which helps to meet the overall county vision that we are uh, refining as part of these uh, visioning workshops. Uh, Stephanie, can I stop you for a question and a comment? Um, the, the polls that you do at the beginning of these sessions are, uh, first of all, I congratulate you on running the sessions in a way that, that I know there's a lot of challenges on your end, and there's a lot of challenges on, on the end of, of many users. So I, I've been on three of them. I think that they've, they've gone rather smoothly. And the first couple of poll questions you put out there are pretty simple, how long you've lived in the county. But when you ask for um, answers to more conceptual questions and you've got 30 or 40 seconds to answer it, I mean, that, for some, that's not even enough time to type, you know, to type that. So I didn't know if you had any plans to, to keep that in place or to just ask for comments in the in the chat room. Um, so that's one question. Um, and then my comment is to follow up on my, my comment yesterday on communications with regard to the Department of Emergency Services. And I guess this is well time because you will be meeting with them is the communications piece particularly this brought to mind four seasons this morning where we have a 55 plus demographic many of whom are moving here from other areas and even a lot of people who live in this area are unaware that our department of emergency services and health department runs a mobile integrated community unit that our 911 call centers help identify what they call frequent flyers these are you know people who need monitoring for fluid levels, um, blood pressure, and that, that that is a service available to these people. And another one is that our Department of Emergency Services is working with um, practices in this area and in Annapolis to kind of serve as a stop back gap between leaving a patient after surgery or whatever home alone and without having to bring in or hire home health care. So that was my expounding upon my point about communications especially in a community like Four Seasons, that they know that if they're coming home after a simple sur a surgery, uh, that their very own Department of Emergency Services could put a helpful guide through the recovery process on some level. So, thank you. Thank you, those are uh, really great comments. Um, and I'll uh, just uh, briefly address your, your second comment uh, first. Uh, when we uh, work on uh, these different comprehensive planning projects, uh, we um, we see that there there are uh, really multiple 
uses for them. Um, and uh, one of those is that, uh, that communications piece and really trying to highlight what makes the county a unique place or, or what are the, um, those special uh, services that are provided or uh, things of that nature. So it not only serves as an informational guide um, as well as a blueprint for how to reach the, the uh, goals and visions over the next 10 to 20 years, um, but also uh, in the same vein helps to serve uh, sort of as that um, uh, marketing type uh, piece of material for, for really a lack of, uh, lack of a better uh, term there. Um, again, just really trying to highlight those um, uh, those different areas, uh, like those two that you just uh, that you just mentioned. Um, so those are the um, uh, some of those pieces that we are going to uh, be working through to incorporate uh, those um, as well as others uh, in these drafts moving forward. Um, and then um, uh, to go back to your. Um, your comment on those open-ended uh, poll questions as part of these as part of these meetings, uh, like you mentioned, the first two questions are uh, typically uh, where do you live and how long have you lived in in the county, uh, and those uh, those two just um, uh, really help us to get a better understanding of who the participants are in the meeting. Um, so. Um, uh, that, that can help us when we um, provide some additional analysis on the comments that we received, um, or just helps to uh, frame the conversation um, if uh, you know 90% of the uh, participants are uh, from one geographic area, we can probably expect that there might be a, a slightly different slant to the conversation than there might have been if they were from um, clear across the other side of the county. Um, uh, the second uh, uh, feature of that is that um, well, I know a lot of us are uh, are participating in many more of these virtual meetings. Um, there are so many different platforms out there, uh, so it really uh, is uh, just a, a quick exercise to help the participants um, get a little bit more familiar with that program um, if they weren't already. Uh, so sort of that uh, twofold uh, purpose for for those initial questions. Uh, and then when we uh, get to more of those open-ended questions, it does uh, become sort of that uh, balancing act between providing um, enough time for some of the respondents to uh, finish their answers while um, keeping the meeting moving along. So it, those are um, uh, challenges that we face as the meeting facilitators um, and there's definitely always opportunities to um, uh, go back and provide additional comments in those uh, chat boxes or um, even to submit any additional comments or questions uh, either uh, via email or through uh, our project website through the uh, comment and feedback form. Um, so we're really um, uh, looking at those two as more of a way to get uh, pieces of information regardless of the um, uh, the way that it comes into us, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Hey, hey Lauren, if I could add two little things to the other side we're monitoring with that is the first part with who's attending and not, we're trying to see if there might be groups that are not participating. Um, besides those who are just participating and if there are other outreach efforts um, or focuses we need to do to make sure we're getting across the board representation that's a uh, you know a big part of it as well you know it's tough in this virtual environment um, to try to make sure we're hitting all of the groups um, the other part of it too is if we see some of those questions or even if you all see some things that we're hearing or maybe not getting enough we can even target some of those questions as being the question of the week or something that we are posting on the website. So it's another opportunity or another venue to get that type of question out um, for additional feedback. And then they would have, you know, even more time to put response and thought together um, if they'd like. So, um, you know, if you all from the commission side see a question or something that you really want to get some feedback on, you know, let us know. We can look to make it those question of the week type questions or do some um, e blast or things like that to try and get additional feedback.
Uh, so at um, uh, at this point, um, we were really hoping to see, um, uh, since you've had a, a chance to uh, take a look at this uh, this chapter, uh, as well as the uh, briefing memo that we put together, um, just if you had uh, any uh, initial thoughts, comments, questions, um, suggestions about um, uh, the content that is included or um, uh, what might not be um, incorporated so far uh, that, that we need to pull in. We'll see that uh, in general we have um, we've gone back and um, uh, to address the uh, the commission's uh, desire to have some um, slight changes to formatting. Uh, we've uh, made those changes in these drafts. Um, also uh, sharing the updated uh, chapters one and two that um, uh, have that that larger font size and tries to uh, just clarify some of the items uh, that are contained uh, within those draft sections. Um, uh, as well as um, uh, including some additional uh, map or uh, figure references um, and um, providing some additional uh, information about areas where uh, the, the commission raised some questions uh, during our, our last meeting. So uh, this is Jeff Reeves. Um, overall, um, thank you for the work that you've put in so far. I found that some of the public comments um, that were brought forth in some of the earlier meetings were interesting in the fact that people felt we didn't have enough um, trails and things of that nature, um, you know, public facilities outdoors. Um, I think the county's worked very hard over the last 10 to 15 years to increase those and negotiations at the county level through the commissioners to add certain things, um, you know, uh, through developer right agreements with the county to upgrade certain facilities, to add trails, to fix trails. You know, you can now go um, across the Kent Narrows um, bridge and around and continue down um, you know, through Graysonville. So I think that, you know, we've made a lot of strides in those respects um, and hopefully you'll capture some of those things uh, in, in your report. Um, that's definitely something that we, uh, that we want to include. Um, again, making sure that the informational component of the uh, of the plan uh, provides uh, information so that um, all of the, uh, the documents and users have that similar uh, baseline of information available. Um, so uh, while we may not get into pages upon pages of discussion, uh, for example, about uh, the county's trip system, uh, we would definitely uh, want to highlight, um, you know, highlight those uh, those informational pieces, and then um, perhaps point people into uh, uh, to the to a direction if they want to find out uh, additional information uh, on those areas. Uh, so that's one of the things where we are. Um, uh, incorporating a lot of different uh, resources, um, both uh, plan, plans and planning efforts uh, that the county has undertaken uh, in the past 10 years, um, as well as um, those of its uh, municipalities um, at, and uh, even some of the neighboring counties uh, and the state uh, and seeing really how we can um, 
provide that broad, comprehensive overview of these different components um, and then still allow for um, some of that additional, more detailed information should, uh, should that be something that someone wants to find more, find out more about. Lauren, an overall question. Um, are you bringing in for comment, um, like the, the corresponding or appropriate county government, like, you know, directors or agencies with respect to these, like, you know, public safety, uh, obviously you're talking to DES. I mean, are you talking to the school board? Are you talking to, um, um, you know, some representatives from the library or talking to, to our Department of Community Services, um, even even economic development, tourism to, to weigh in on, on some of these? Uh, we, we have been having some of those initial conversations um, and reaching out to uh, those uh, various uh, county departments or um, uh, even some of the uh, local organizations uh, within within the county. Um, and that's going to be an ongoing process to um, to uh, make those contacts and incorporate uh, in incorporate that information. Um, uh, in addition to sort of those um, uh, more one-on-one, -on -one, if you will, either conversations or in informational exchanges. Uh, we also have uh, the technical committee, uh, which uh, has a similar um, topic set up as the, the special topic workshops, which are similarly uh, matched to the different uh, conversations uh, that we're having with the planning commission uh, to really um, uh, drill down on some of those uh, different areas um, in slightly different ways. Uh, so the, uh, that technical committee is uh, comprised of um, uh, either department heads or representatives from the uh, different agencies um, to provide an overarching um, uh, source of uh, additional technical uh, guidance uh, for us as we as we move throughout this this process um, so not only um, having one-on-one -on -one discussions uh, for example um, about the uh, uh, Department of Emergency Services but um, then um, how might that um, how might that topic uh, impact uh, some of the other uh, the other departments um, or areas within the plan itself okay. so we'll be having more and more of those um, as this process uh, as this process moves forward. Thank you. Uh, so I guess um are that were there uh, did the commission have any uh, any more specific comments or questions about uh, about that draft or any of its of its components um, uh, or any of the different workshops um, that we that we've held to date? I think we're good. Um, well, if you uh, continue to go through those, and um, if anything comes up, um, you know, please uh, please reach out to us and let us know about those. Um, and then, really, uh, just a, a brief overview. Uh, again, we have our last uh, visioning workshop uh, that is taking place this evening, with the uh, the focus on um, the county as a whole, uh, as well as the North County area. Uh, that will be um, extremely similar to uh, uh, layout and um, uh, conversation starters um, as was uh, done for the first visioning workshop, um, uh, but just providing uh, additional opportunities for um, that larger geographic area and the uh, stakeholders within it to uh, provide some additional uh, comments or questions or if they weren't able to make the first uh, the first meeting. Um, uh, we've got a number of special topic workshops uh, coming up in the, the coming weeks. Uh, so those next ones uh, will have a focus on environment, the environment uh, and transportation. 
uh, and then looking at historic and cultural resources, uh, as well as housing. Uh, you, in your uh, meeting packets, uh, you sh I believe that you um, uh, may have received a copy of our updated uh, schedule. Um, that's uh, also available on the project website. Uh, and then uh, information about individual uh, meetings or workshops uh, are also being posted uh, to the website uh, as well as um, uh, to the county website and it's uh, the social media uh, avenues that it has. Um, and then um, uh, similarly uh, looking in the same vein as those uh, different uh, topic workshops, uh, we're also um, again holding the technical committee workshops and um, just to make make very clear I mean, this is this is a really a, a working group where we are um, looking at some of those more technical issues uh, so these are um, uh, internal meetings uh, which is why there there's not more promotion of them um, outside of just uh, general informational uh, pieces here and there uh, then again, the uh, future planning commission meetings will uh, <coughs> see those uh, different topic areas um, uh, with uh, the um, uh, discussions on environmental resources and protection and transportation uh, coming up in March, uh, and then housing and historic and cultural resources in April. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any questions from the commission? Okay. Next on the agenda, we have public comments. Second, real quick. I don't think we've had anyone come in. Uh, no, we're good. Okay. Can I get a motion to adjourn? A moved. Second? Thank you. Who's second? Art. Art. Thank you. All right, everyone have a safe weekend, and um, hopefully we'll see most of you on Zoom tonight at 5.30. done from the meeting so they didn't have the sound oh i turned it back up it's for not that's all right well, they're gone yeah they exited <laughs> yeah apparently they decided